Hello, welcome to Implementing Microfocus Service Virtualization at a global pharmacy retail chain. Today's SIG webinar is sponsored by Vivit's Performance Engineering Special Interest Group. Vicki Giavelli is Director of Product Management Performance Engineering for Microfocus. Uh, portfolio, the portfolio, portfolio includes Load Runner, Performance Center, Storm Runner Load, Network Virtualization, and Silk Performer. Vicky is responsible for driving and executing the future strategy, roadmap, and promoting optimal solution usage and best practices for microfocus load performance engineering products. Paul Shovelin, that's me, Director of Check Client Management, Checkpoint Technologies. I've been in software testing for over 20 years. And I currently lead a performance test team at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Pitar Piscarich. Associate VP, Performance Engineer, uh, Bank of America. Pitar has a deep technical competence across a wide range of technologies. And as many of you know, his MacGyver-esque problem-solving abilities are legendary. And as I mentioned, I'm your host today. Today's speaker is Amit Patel, Principal Consultant, Performance Engineering and Service Virtualization Practice, Patson, USA. Uh, we're going to learn a lot more about meat, and, but let's first uh, address some housekeeping items. Today's live session is intended for all Vivit members. The on-demand recording slide deck and questions and answers will be posted on the Vivit website, visible for all, for all members. We will send you a link via email once they are posted to the Vivit website. If you have any questions as we go along, please type and send them in using the questions pane in the webinar control panel, which we're going to show you here. Um, it usually appears in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to submit a question. Make sure the questions pane is expanded. Type in your question and then click send. Feel free to ask questions about MicroFocus products, as we also have Jacob Vondrock from MicroFocus R&D on the webinar. Thank you for joining us today, Jacob. Uh, so let's get started. I'll go ahead and pass it over to Meet. Meet, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everyone. This is Amit Patil. First of all, I would like to thank you for your time and attention in attending this webinar. These are two very important things one could give to someone, so that is appreciated. I hope I'll do justice to that in this session. Here's the agenda for today. Um, I'll do a quick introduction of myself and of Patson USA, the company that I work for. We will watch a video. It's a short one of about three minutes. And I have been informed that uh, not everybody on this call may be familiar with uh, the service virtualization concept. So I included some slides to fill in this gap. That is what we are going to see uh, in the next section, which is what is service virtualization and software lifecycle virtualization? What is the business case, um, the need and benefits? We'll then move on to how we went about the tool selection process for our customer and what were the steps followed for the extensive proof of concept that we did. Then we will move on to uh, the post tool selection steps and the governance model that we have put in uh, for our customer. We will then talk about various different technical capabilities that we have implemented. This is the section where we'll be showing you some animations. It's going to be pretty interesting. Then uh, we'll talk about how uh, we defined our software uh, uh, SV lifecycle, the engagement model that we created and uh, some examples of return on investment that we have brought for our client. Then we'll talk about what's beyond a service virtualization tool um, in, in the next section, because service virtualization uh, is not just about a particular tool or implementing a tool. It's, it's much more than that. We'll talk about that. Then we will talk about how we went with a adoption and sustenance plan for our customer, uh, which has a huge IT organization spanning multiple continents. And then we'll talk about where are we headed next um, in terms of technology and as a company. And then uh, the last but not the least would be various different challenges that we faced uh, in implementing uh, this platform, the lessons that we learned, and some aha moments. So I hope uh, you'll stick around until the last section. It's going to be really interesting. So this is me. Um, I work as a principal consultant at Patson USA. I'm primarily responsible for the performance testing slash 
engineering and uh, the service virtualization practice of our company. Um, by the way, the QR code is uh, displayed on the right hand side. So if anybody wants to scan and just uh, have this information stored on your phones, feel free to scan that QR code. Um, I have about 15 years of industry experience in IT uh, doing performance testing um, and uh, I've worked on many different uh, uh, architectural uh, concepts of uh, soft SOA microservices, SAP based architectures, some client uh, server uh, architectures. In my uh, old days, I used to be a J2E developer and a web developer. I've consulted for about 12 plus companies um, and I'm uh, considered as a subject matter expert on uh, SV, application performance monitoring, performance testing, uh, doing uh, evaluating and recommending uh, QA practices and setting up of COEs at our customer site. I've been extensively trained by Indian Army Special Forces and uh, was awarded uh, something called as a best cadet among 700 uh, cadets by the President of India. So a little bit about our company, Patson USA. We have been a partner of HP, HPE uh, since 2011. And uh, after uh, MicroFocus was launched um, on the US side, the spin merger that happened, uh, we have been a partner of MicroFocus since 2017. We are their design partner, we are their software resellers and their implementation partner. We have done the biggest implementation of service virtualization in the world. Um, we have submitted uh, well over 25 enhancement requests for different products of MicroFocus. We are also a QA staffing and advisory uh, and services based organization. We have been involved in uh, more than 200 projects at our customer sites, testing more than 3000 applications uh, of various different kinds. From a SV perspective, perspective, our mission is to help our clients IT to significantly scale up their capacity and deliver more projects by boosting productivity and by removing any wait times for any dependent services. Our SLV practice, um, that's where I'm involved in, is focused on virtualizing applications in lower environments, so that is pre-production environments, enabling IT teams to conduct componentized development integration testing, and performance testing, um, uh, in, and in some cases, system integration testing by emulating any internal and external endpoints. So we are going to quickly watch a uh, video of a Hollywood star that was filmed about a year and a half ago, um, talking about uh, service virtualization implementation. Mm -hmm. Patson USA uh, was requested by one of the major pharmacy retail companies in the United States to uh, provide service virtualization services for them. Our initial challenges were in identifying what are the use cases where service virtualization could really help and which of those use cases could bring the maximum value. And we identified about 500 different use cases where the service virtualization would be used. We invited all of the four major suppliers of service virtualization platforms along with some open source tools as well. Instead of having the pre-sales uh, solution architects do this POC, we did a hands-on by ourselves so that we could evaluate the user friendliness of these platforms. So finally, after evaluating all of these criteria, MicroFocus Service Virtualization Platform was chosen as the winner. As of today, we have more than 400 plus virtual services that we have implemented for this client. We have hammered the standalone servers up to 3,000 transactions per second uh, with about 150 services running at any given time. So the performance of the tool is really great. I would look at the performance from two different angles. One is performance of the standalone server, which is the runtime environment. That's where we have these 400 plus virtual services running. And the other is the performance of the designer itself, which is the IDE integrated uh, development environment that we developers use. We have noticed that uh, our applications are much more stable in production by using service virtualization. Our performance testers have been able to test the applications with virtualized endpoints that would uh, simulate timeouts, that would simulate slowness and whatnot. So using virtual services instead of the real ones really helps. Our partnership with MicroFocus R&D team has been excellent. This team is very willing to take on additional enhancement requests. We work with them on a weekly basis. We have also a design partnership and we can influence the roadmap of the tool. And so this kind of partnership has been really mind-blowing. 
The return on investment on service virtualization has been the talk of town at this client. Our leadership loves the investment that they did and the returns that we have brought. So in the past three and a half years of our implementation of SV, we have upwards of $16 million of confirmed savings in terms of infrastructure avoidance, speed to market, improved productivity, and early detection of integration defects. We are happy to see the customers happy. Uh, we have solved a lot of their problems and we would love to do more. Okay. In case if you'd like to show it, uh, show this video to your colleagues or to your leadership, it can be found on YouTube. Just type uh, service virtualization and scroll down to the good looking guy and you'll have the video. So let's jump into what so, uh, SV and uh, SLV is. SLV stands for Software Lifecycle Virtualization. It is just an evolution of service virtualization. Um, it is the use of virtualization in the pre-production portion of a software lifecycle, and it is the ability to capture and simulate the behavior and data and performance characteristics of dependent systems that are either currently unavailable or are in an unusable state. Let's take a look of what's underneath the hood of service virtualization. So, all of the service virtualization tools that are out there, be them commercial tools or open source tools, they work around a concept called listeners. There are inbuilt listeners for transport protocols. So for example, here on the screen, you see uh, there are three years. So these are like three inbuilt listeners that are listening to HTTP-based traffic, um, some uh, JMS-based traffic. You can see TIPCO EMS, IBM MQ, SAG web methods, generic JMS. They, they pretty much mean the same thing. You know, They are all working on JMS. I've shown an example of file system uh, uh, listeners. So there are many such transport protocols and there are multiple listeners built in into these service virtualization tools. So they listen to this traffic and then they provide wizards to add any business logic. So that means you add more intelligence to the traffic that you are listening to. You can also add some performance characteristics um, to the captured traffic and that's how you create a virtual service. This is the underlying principle for all service virtualization tools. So let's take a look at how do you make a business case? What's the need for software lifecycle virtualization? On the left hand side of the screen, you're seeing a traditional pre-prod environment that is not using any service virtualization. You see that the application under test is shown as in the orange colors, that's a system under test, and it's connected to uh, third-party applications, it has its mobile app, it has its own backend system, and it's connected to some legacy systems. Now, without service virtualization, there may be challenges in testing your application. So for example, there might be some access fees um, that you have to pay when you are accessing a third-party uh, API, or let's say the mobile application is under development, or your backend system, uh, there isn't enough suitable test data, or maybe the test data sanity isn't always maintained. Uh, in the legacy system, maybe it has limited access. Um, there might be only a handful of environments that are not connected to your uh, system under test. Now service virtualization would solve all of these problems that we have stated in this example. So we take out the um, dependencies and we mock them and create virtual services and hence we eliminate those. What does it result in? It results in testing of your application earlier that means you could get your releases out to production faster. You improve the product quality. You uh, lower the infrastructure costs, and you uh, take out the dependency on any constraint systems. So just to recapture all of the benefits that I just talked about, we categorize those benefits into three different categories. There's quality. You have uh, much more stable test environments. You have testing, uh, integration testing that, that could be done earlier in your development cycle. Um, you have increased test coverage. You are shifting your testing left. Um, there are uh, benefits from a cost perspective. You are decreasing third-party access expense, reducing budgets for provide, uh, provisioning and ma managing testing environments, and you are sharing uh, the virtualized assets. You are re reducing your overall cost 
um, that you may incur due to late uh, project deliverables and you are improving the speed of your product. Now we'll talk about how we went with the tool selection process uh, for our customer and the proof of concept that we did. So here are some of the steps that we followed before purchasing the tool. Um, so we were already handling the performance engineering practice of our customer and we were using some traditional methods to create mocks using uh, 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 application development tools, uh, IDE, like rational application developer. We, is, we were standing up mocks um, by ourselves and that was very painstaking because even to stand up a simple uh, SOAP service, we had to uh, put in the skeleton around it and make sure that uh, it is hosted on a powerful enough environment that would uh, um, be able to handle all of the uh, load that we were pushing through our performance testing. So we were spending a lot of time on that. We made a business case to our leadership um, that if we were to have a service virtualization platform, we would uh, be doing a performance testing much more quicker. And also we would not have to uh, wait or, uh, or rely on the integration points um, that were connected to our application under test, mainly because those integration points, those backend systems were out of our control. We did not have any control on its performance, neither did we have any uh, insight into the performance metrics of those uh, backend applications. So we made that business case. Then we were uh, tasked with, okay, go ahead and conduct a, uh, a thorough uh, investigation of what are the use cases uh, that we are, that the company is going to need. Now, this is where it got interesting because now we were not just one of the, the performance testing team was not just one of the end users that was going to be using service virtualization. There were many different lines of businesses within a huge IT organization, like I said earlier, spanning multiple continents. So what we did is we went around, we contacted all of the departments, we started collecting their use cases. Uh, where service virtualization could help. And we, when we did this, we had to explain to everyone how what the service virtualization concept is. And then we collected all of these requirements from developers, from functional QA teams, from performance team, and actually in some cases from the business analyst team as well. So after collecting all of these inputs from various different domains, we then worked with the integration architecture team and we collected their requirements as well. The integration architecture team at this particular customer wasn't falling in any of the business domains. And they gave us an additional uh, list of use cases. So when we combined all of these use cases that turned out to be more than 500 or so, and then what we did is we picked, we did a business value assessment for all of the use, those use cases uh, to see where the maximum value could be brought in by using service virtualization. Now, we couldn't do all of these 500 use cases uh, uh, during the proof of concept, right? So what we did is we used a common denominator in the form of a transport protocol. So we divided all of these 500 use cases into transport protocols. So for example, how many of these use cases fall under HTTP criteria? How many of them fall under some other uh, transport protocol? Then we, we, we were actually uh, in parallel rallying for funding across divisions uh, since SV concept was new to our customer. Um, we then, uh, once we locked down the scope of the proof of concept, we invited uh, four of the major suppliers of service virtualization platforms, um, uh, the commercial service virtualization platforms. Uh, our team luckily was already aware of some of these uh, tools because we had uh, implemented uh, one of the competitor products at another uh, customer here in Chicago. Um, so what we did is we, after the, we invited these cust uh, SV uh, vendors, we did hands-on proof of concept by ourselves. We didn't let the solution architects uh, show us what their tools were capable of. We wanted to feel, the, feel each of these tools and we wanted to do uh, this hands-on by ourselves. That was very critical. We then, um, we also evaluated some open source platforms because we were asked to see if it, there is any need to even purchase anything. Uh, so we evaluated about six different open source platforms for service virtualization. Um, we did a performance benchmarking um, uh, at our site, at our own uh, uh, customer site. And we also requested for performance benchmarking numbers from the vendors. 
and we really dissected these performance uh, benchmarking numbers that the vendors had provided so we were very careful we we had about a 25 point questionnaire that we asked to these vendors of how they conducted this performance testing and once we were convinced of okay this is these numbers that they are providing us really mean um so and so based on the questionnaire we we were then comfortable with the with those performance numbers we also looked at many different functionalities um not just very straightforward but even functionalities where exceptions timeouts um where if if these tools are capable of uh, handling those if they have the ability to put any security controls for virtual services whether or not they are capable of any uh, doing attachments for like mtom attachments uh, are they able to simulate long running processes or asynchronous processes are they capable of doing any b2b like uh, edi uh, transactions we checked um, whether they can do uh, this they conform to various web service specifications like ws security ws policy ws rm and ws addressing um, so on and so forth and also um, the whether they are capable of handling binary messages any fixed length protocol related messages so on and uh, so forth so it was a very extensive list of uh, business criteria that we had collected for this tool for the pr uh, proof of concept and then what we did is after we did a hands on poc of all the tools we did a, a weight point average uh, type of scoring system um and then we divided that into five different categories so how was the pricing capabilities configuration flexibility and resources so i'm just going to show you an example of two of the top contenders um that we had shortlisted um uh, uh, to purchase so you can see that we uh, for each of those uh, points that i mentioned we had further category categories so for capabilities we had features we had uh, um various different purposes uh, as you can read that this will be available uh, after the webinar as well in a slide deck i'm not going to go through all of them so we did a uh, scoring system based on the weightage that i talked about earlier uh, for capabilities for configuration for flexibility for uh, resources um and for pricing obviously so once we selected a tool let's talk about what did we go through as a post tool selection process and what was the governance model that we had to put up so we had to work on the hardware sizing uh, requirement because um because this tool was going to be used throughout the enterprise uh, so we had to make sure that uh, um the hardware was going to be sufficient to handle the workload across all lines of businesses within the organization so we came up with uh, the final tps numbers that we came up with was about 3000 transactions per second is what we needed to size this environment to because this was going to be heavily used uh, for performance testing throughout the organization then we worked with the uh, selected vendor so in this case it was microfocus and i was very pleasantly surprised um, that they had done a very good analysis they had even given us the cpu specifications that would be needed for to achieve the 3000 transactions per second so that made our life a whole lot easier we then went through the procurement process of the hardware um at our customer site we had to face the a usual dilemma of uh, whether we should go with a virtualized hardware or a, a standalone hardware um we uh, then we went through um, some validations with our security teams at the customer site they wanted to make sure that the tool stores the data appropriately that there are enough controls around it that nobody unauthorized can get to the data that uh, we were capturing because let me remind you that these tools can sniff data from any environment that you connect them to so in some cases if we were going to connect it to production to just sniff out some request response pairs there was a good possibility that the data that we collected would have our customers data so we had to go through an extensive tool validation process with the security teams then we did a software installation and microfocus uh, hp at that time helped us in uh, doing the installations it's it's very straightforward there wasn't anything much complicated uh, uh in the software installation we just had to make some decisions of whether or not to use a sql server express edition or an enterprise edition and so on and so forth then we conducted the uh, training sessions uh, formally um, these were uh, done 
for uh, uh, our team members and uh, some other team members that were going to use the service virtualization platform. Then we set up the governance model um, because we already had experience implementing service virtualization using another tool at a different customer. This was a little bit easier for us. Um, I mean, we had some data to rely on. So we created a governance model, um, just to name a few uh, things under it. Underneath it, we did a decent estimation model uh, of how to estimate uh, when a requirement comes in for service virtualization. Um, we did a service virtualization SDLC process that I'm going to talk about in the later slides. Then we developed a communication strategy and things like that that are typically needed for governance. Um, at this organization, there, since everybody was new to the service virtualization concept, none of the project uh, uh, project management teams or the program management teams had any tasks for service virtualization in their templates. So we had to work with all the project managers and program management groups throughout the organization to ensure that they indeed put a task for service virtualization or at least check with the service virtualization team if this would be needed much ahead of time. Um, that is the process that we did. Um, that means the, it was a SV injection into the, uh, any program's SDLC at the customer side. We created a work intake process, uh, basically a ticketing mechanism using Jira and uh, asking the right set of questions to our uh, customers who needed service virtualization. We did a, developed a communication strategy. We would conduct roundtable sessions. We would have uh, monthly bulletins going out of what service virtualization was doing. We would uh, try to focus on the ROIs and get more and more teams involved um, with us and get more uh, virtualized services uh, created for their own benefits. Um, we developed a very extensive hardware and software maintenance process. At this customer site, our team uh, maintains uh, both of these things. Um, we had to create a couple of inventories uh, as we realized that uh, there was a lot of demand coming in uh, for service virtualization. Uh, we had to have separate inventories for uh, the virtualized services that we were creating. And these inventories are very extensive uh, in the number of fields that they contain. We also created uh, inventories for uh, managing the MQs that we were having built uh, or created, sorry, uh, for our service virtualization purposes. We maintain a firewall inventory because at our customer, um, none of the two machines can talk to each other directly. There has to be a firewall that has to be open between any two systems. So we were maintaining that kind of firewall inventory. Um, we did a quick uh, FAQs for troubleshooting for our internal team members. If something was broken, you know what, uh, what are the steps they need to follow to quickly get it up to speed again. Um, we also, did uh, software installations across the infrastructure. Um, so uh, this is not just a regular HPSV installation, but uh, the other uh, softwares that are needed to go along with it. So for example, you need an MQ Explorer to drop messages for testing purposes, so on and so forth. Um, we did an inventory to uh, check, uh, to track the various different access levels that team members had. Uh, because as our team grew, eventually at one point we had 17 members in the service virtualization team alone, and we had to track what each person had access to. Um, we have a wiki site that we have developed for our end users um, that displays the various different capabilities. Um, then we developed a SV operational model, and I'm going to quickly talk about what was involved in it. Um, I'm just showing here the RACI portion of the SV operational model. So we had SV organization charts, SV team roles and responsibilities, um, and what are the roles and responsibilities that are needed from our client teams? That means from our requesters, like business team, development team, QA teams, uh, pre-prod uh, run teams, that means environment teams, and some enterprise shared services teams. Um, here is the uh, flow, process flow that we had developed for the operational model. So as you can see, if somebody submits a SV request, we review that request and we make a decision whether or not a service, a virtual service would really help in this case. So if the decision is yes, then we move to the estimation phase and request for funding uh, for that virtualized service. We then provide a high level uh, SV scope and approve funding for resources. And then it gets assigned to the SV developer who then works uh, uh, through the next steps, which is, uh, reading through the high-level design solution architecture documents, working with uh, the requesters, so on and so forth. 
Let's take a look at various different capabilities that we have implemented. This is where we get into the more technical stuff. So in the video that, that you saw, that was actually shot a year and a half ago, in which I stated we had 400 services by then. But now we have upwards of 520 virtual services that we have implemented. Um, we have done many SOAP and RESTful services for HTTP as well as uh, HTTPS. That's a, a secured uh, version of HTTP. And uh, this tool is capable of doing both one-way as well as two-way SSL communication. We have done some fixed length protocol uh, virtualized services. Uh, we have done some uh, uh, virtual services that use the binary uh, message formats um, on uh, various different uh, JMS platforms. So at our client, we have IBM MQ, Data Power, we have Software AGs, uh, Universal Messaging Platform. And uh, we developed some services on the file system um, uh, protocol and also using FTP and SFTP. We have uh, some limited services that use TCP-based uh, virtual services. Then we did SAP virtualization. Now, let me just quickly tell you what SAP virtualization is. So basically, SAP components connect, talk to each other using IDOC messages. So if one of the SAP components is not available, this is where you could use service virtualization. And uh, the SV would start acting as if it is a SAP component. And it, it has the ability to communicate using IDOC. So we did that. Um, we did something called as Java virtualization. Um, so what Java virtualization is, is it's the ability to modify the behavior of any particular method within your Java code. So let me give you an example. We were asked to do performance testing. I mean, one of the performance testing teams came, came to us uh, to solve this problem. So there was this authentication mechanism and there was this particular method uh, that was asking, is the authentication okay? That means has the user come in through the right channels? If it is yes, then it would allow the, uh, the end user to go into the application. And if it is no, then he would be uh, denied the uh, access. So we had to overcome this because it was just practically impossible to create 8,000 different uh, uh, user IDs for them. So what we did is we used this Java virtualization and the tool allows you to do that. And we just looked for that particular method and any calls coming to that method, we would just redirect them to uh, virtual services and the virtual service would say, yeah, authentication is okay. And we would let that person in. So this is how we did Java virtualization. The next is database virtualization. Actually, I should have named it uh, JDBC virtualization. So this is the ability uh, where we could replay the SQLs or actually the SQL results. So let's say if you have a Java application connecting to a database, but that database is not available for some reason, or let's say uh, different developers in a team need access to different schemas of database at the same time. Now to stand up such things uh, is, is kind of time consuming depending on which organization you're working in. So we uh, have this database virtualization implemented. So our tool, the SV tool acts as if it is the database and it looks for those SQL communications and it responds back with a result set. So the application under test will never know that it's actually connecting to a, um, a virtualized uh, database. And I have a picture to show about that. Then we did something called as device virtualization. So this was done outside of the SV tool. Um, we were asked by one of the automation teams to solve a problem. So at our customer site, everything begins, every business flow begins with a prescription. Um, so somebody brings in the prescription, the technician working at our stores, uh, at our customer stores, they scan the prescription through a physical, physical hardware. Now, um, somebody had, uh, before we, were, we came in into this customer, uh, somebody had downloaded some DLL from, from the internet that was not supported, uh, that would act as if it is a physical scanner. Now, after they migrated to, from Windows XP to the next version, I believe to the Windows 7 version, that DLL broke and there was no support for it. So that resulted in about 350 automation test cases not being able to execute. And we were asked to virtu solve that problem. So then we looked at it and we figured out the underlying mechanism of which service calls are made after somebody scans through the physical hardware. And we basically created the same uh, mechanism to call those underlying services. And that's what how we overcame that challenge. And that's what we call as device virtualization. In addition to that, uh, we were always asked to see our customers don't really understand the difference between what is capable, 
what is possible through a service virtualization tool versus not. So sometimes they would ask us, can you do virtualized data creation here? So instead of just flatly saying no, uh, what we did is we went on this path um, of creating web applications for data creation. So as of now, we have about 19 different web applications created for, our, for this particular client just for data creation. And then we have our own health check mechanisms that we have created to um, uh, proactively monitor uh, our uh, uh, virtualized services. Now, let me just quickly show you uh, one of the examples of uh, service virtualization. This is at one of our customers' uh, site where uh, the, uh, the very last call to a integration point was taking a couple of days because it was a manual process. Somebody would be notified that there is an incoming request for them, and then that person would pick up that request, go to the storage center, and then manually check whether or not that thing is available there and then respond back. So that turnaround was four to five days because this was done internationally. And this typically halted the uh, testing for that much amount of time. So this is how it worked in, uh, without service virtualization. I'm just showing this to show you how virtualization could be done for a file system based um, uh, communication. So on the left hand side, you see a user who is using a SAP GUI and he does some sorry uh, he does something called as a, a delivery and uh, obviously that sap gui is connected to the sap server and that delivery is then converted to a idoc message and that idoc message is dropped onto some queues and tipco then picks it up that was the middleware they were using uh, once tipco picks it up it puts it on a particular uh, folder in a file system and then the third party um, in another country would pick up that message shown here in number five in the sequence and then process that message after a couple of days and drop it again uh, on the folder four that uh, can, be see, can be seen here. Tipco then would pick up that message and send a PGI, which is, uh, uh, I forgot the full form for it, but it's a SAP terminology. And then SAP would mark as delivery completed. This is the process that was there without service virtualization. Now what happens when that connection breaks or if there are too many delays uh, from the third party side, basically the end user is stuck at that point. So this is how we recorded the traffic using MicroFocus service virtualization tool. You can see that we reconfigured uh, the uh, file system. We just created two, diff two additional folders and had Tipco uh, drop off these messages um, at those folders, as you can see here. So basically, Instead of the third party picking up those messages, we had MicroFocus SV tool pick up the messages as is indicated here in sequence number five. Then it would send that message to the real system uh, indicated in sequence number six and seven. The real system would then pick up that message, send it back using sequence numbers eight and nine shown here, and then it would process back to the end user. Uh, this is what we use to learn the traffic. So when I say learn, the, the, these tools all have a sniffing ability. That means a proxy ability. You could run any traffic through them and it will capture the request and response pairs for that communication. Now we broke the, we broke the connections from MicroFocus SV to the third party because now there is no need to send that communication to the third party, right? Because we were trying to get rid of it just to solve, to make it run quicker. And once we cut that connection, we put the virtual service in something called as a simulate mode. That means it's running on its own. So this is how uh, the topology looked. So the MicroFocus SV tool is now responding back with a message, uh, as you can see here. Now let's take a look at another example. So at our customer site, uh, we, they have upwards of 10,000 of stores. Uh, throughout America. And they have these workstations that are connected to their local uh, uh, local application called CPD, Central Prescription Delivery, um, which is then connected to a central uh, prescription uh, app that, that's sitting in the data center. It has its own database. And any calls coming for um, any get customer calls or get detail calls, go through a channel to a centralized omni-channel application. That is what I'm trying to show you here. Um, it's just the intermediary uh, uh, architecture that it follows. So a message is dropped to a first set of MQ, then is dropped to another set of MQs, and then the omni-channel uh, backend picks it up and then responds back with a uh, message back to the 
uh, workstation and in, this is done for all get calls for all update calls they use our customer uses a tool called um, it's a oracle based uh, software called golden gate which basically looks for any commits uh, to the uh, database and then it transports those calls to the omni channel this way everything is synchronized so as you can see here at the top portion those, that's the mechanism followed for get calls the bottom portion is for update calls now we were tasked with uh, this challenge of um, uh, creating a system like omni channel and this was a really huge task because we had to now think about synchronization of data uh, for not just for get calls we couldn't just do static responses in this case we had to be very dynamic the data had to be uh, consistent across multiple databases and we the golden putting another instance of golden gate was super expensive so this is what we came up with um, so this is a local uh, application connected to central application no changes so far then it drops the message through an adapter server and then to a queue mq from here we pick it up uh, that means the sv tool picks it up and then re uh, which this sv tool is now acting like the virtualized omni channel now we redirect a call to a soap service that we built using java this soap service would go and read from the database so now the soap service is acting as if it is a golden gate we evaluated different uh, architectural concepts around this and this was one of the straightforward ways to do it so now we are responding back to the uh, workstation so in this case we um, overcame this challenge of synchronizing the data right we are not just responding with static messages but indeed this data is synced across all the databases in the system and we had to write some heavy business logic uh, in that soap service that's why we just spin it off as a different application um, earlier i was talking about this database virtualization concept and here you can see uh, how it's done so basically you make the your application under test uh, you give it a different uh, jdbc connection string and um, that's using that connection string the sv server picks up any messages going to the real database so that means the sequels will now flow through this sv server and if needed they can be redirected to the real database or they can be just responded directly from the sv server back to the end user this is the high level topology that we implemented um, uh, for this customer so there is the designer uh, that's sitting on our laptops and um, then there is a the runtime environment this is where the micro focus sv server portion is sitting all of the servers are uh, services that we created are deployed on this particular server and this tool needs a database uh, for itself that's why we have created a separate uh, licensed uh, sql server enterprise version of it now let's take a look at what is the sv life cycle uh, that we followed um, so as in any um, any uh, software uh, sdlc we follow typical steps so for requirements gathering we have the sv requesters fill out requests uh, using our jira we then gather and understand any solution architecture high level designs low level designs we look at the physical top uh, and logical topologies and that kind of thing we try to collect uh, at least two sets of request and response pairs from the real service developers if they are available and if the real service is functionally tested we gather the soap ui project if there is one we have uh, extensive uh, working sessions with the requester team to understand better understand the requirement and we then create sequence diagrams we then open the firewalls this is uh, what we do in the requirements gathering phase then we move on to the analysis so we identify all service virtual services that are needed and see if uh, if those are actually needed uh, then we make a decision and then um, for example i'll give one instance um, where we avoided virtual service creation we just uh, used uh, some code um, that would just not make a call to that particular database because that database was just um, not uh, at all important in the uh, process flow um, we then finalize the technology that is used uh, in addition to microfocus uh, sv tool so if there is a need to create any separate java web services and things like that or if there is a need to create any web application and if the service is going to be built we decide then whether we are going to learn the traffic or uh, are we going to um, hand build the service then we move on to design uh, as in any software uh, we create a, a design document for the virtual service and then we submit this design into our uh, team's sharepoint site 
then we move on to the implementation um, this is where the sv developers will actually build the service and there are multiple ways to build a service we are not going to get into details of that but maybe um, you can we, do a demo or something of that sort in the future and then we uh, do a testing and in this testing what we do is we do our own unit testing uh, using soap ui or something like postman uh, and such kinds of uh, tools or mq explorers to drop any messages then we move on to um, integration testing with the uh, app, real application so this is where we make the real application point to our virtual services instead of the real ones and that's how we um, do that we then do, uh, just deploy and maintain uh, that service and make any changes that are further necessary uh, for the requester um, since uh, we have been extensively doing performance uh, uh, testing for our client we have a performance coe as well as a service virtualization coe at our customer side we created this unique engagement model that that is uh, applicable to both waterfall as well as agile methodologies uh, without getting into too much detail i'll just say that the blue portions are applicable for the performance coe and the green ones are for the service virtualization coe again this uh, content will be available for you later now let's take a look at an roi example um, initially, we didn't have a proper mechanism to uh, display what the return on investment is uh, to our customer. So this was from the very first project of service virtualization, um, that application, um, I just renamed it to ABC. And we uh, this allowed to us to conduct uh, simultaneous testing of two different code bases at the same time. It reduced uh, the dependency on availability by 80% and uh, allowed narrowing focus on the uh, uh, that applications bottlenecks rather than integration components so we were not really putting dollar amounts as you can see um, in our first ROI then in a, in the second uh, project that we did we had uh, we, we started putting dollar amounts so in this project we had about 84 integration defects that we caught just by using service virtualization that would have been impossible to catch without SV and then we put a dollar amount of two thousand dollars per defect and uh, that was our ROI. So it was pretty rudimentary. And then later, as we evolved into more, um, uh, uh, as we evolved as a service virtualization team, as a COE, we then got into more complicated things. And what we did is we divided the 500 or so services that we implemented into four different categories. Which of the services helped us avoid environments? Which of those avoid, helped us avoid, uh, caught the early defects in uh, integration? Uh, which of the services helped us increase the speed to market and which of the services improved productivity so if you add all of these together it comes to about 16 million dollars this is a, a year and a half old slide uh, you can see the improved productivity is uh, less because th this is where we got into hot waters with uh, our clients uh, sometimes because they were not uh, really re readily acceptable to the fact that they were not really productive from the get-go um, since we became so successful at this particular client um, that invited some spotlight um, and I would say like a media attention so if there was something broken in an environment and if that environment was using virtual services they would first blame the virtual services team so what we did is we created proactive health check mechanisms for all of our virtual services that and these health check mechanisms run every 15 minutes they notify us via email if something is really broken because of us and uh, it automatically logs tickets uh, to us as well as to any uh, supporting environment teams and we display the appropriate on or off flags on the uh, developers' uh, websites. We monitor the uh, usage of all the virtual services that we have ever built for them. Uh, we uh, have about 19 web utilities, like I mentioned, and we do something called as, a, uh, we hook up every application to this monitoring utility so that we can monitor the uh, usage of it from a functional perspective. We also monitor the performance and this is inbuilt into the SV tool. We being uh, so successful, we had to make sure that SV continues to be adopted and there was a sustenance plan in place. So this is just an example of the presentation that we did to our customers. Um, uh, at the client side so we told them if you don't adapt to service virtualization basically you are going to fail that's that's the gist of this particular slide now we 
what were the different uh, tactical techniques that we implemented for fostering adoption and reinforcement of service virtualization? How do we let uh, ask force the developers or the the QA team to use service virtualization for the benefit of their project? So we created focus groups. We did many managerial interviews, audit compliance, performance measurement, so on and so forth. So we have a mechanism for that. Uh, we gave recommendations to uh, continue to uh, con take the training that uh, our SV team provides throughout the organization. Now, let me quickly talk about where are we headed. Now, where are we headed is, in short, um, we are in the process of building something where we just scan the visitors or we just create a skeleton virtual service that does not have much business logic in it. And we just spin it off. We just deploy it and let the developers by themselves or the end users by themselves put some business logic on top of top of it this is where we are headed so instead of us the sv team creating all the virtual services from a to z we are seeking help uh, or allowing the end users to create virtual services by themselves this is the something that is in the works um we are also working on some intern IoT related uh, virtualization. So uh, unfortunately, due to confidentiality reasons, I cannot really share uh, about that IoT technology that we are implementing. But just be reminded that uh, the SV platforms already has um, a support for um, IoT. Now to the last section, um, what were the challenges uh, and uh, uh, some good and bad moments? So expectations, uh, defining the line between service virtualization, data creation, hardware virtualization, database virtualization was, was very critical for us because like I said earlier, not all of our end users were aware of where to draw that line. What is possible using service virtualization versus not? So we are typically looked upon as a team that is an innovation team that we, if given a problem, we are able to innovate. That was, uh, that is what we ended up doing. Um, we had many, uh, debates on whether or not service virtualization is a specialized skill or with, is it a commodity skill. So I, I don't want to get into a debate about that, but that is up to everybody's uh, own imagination. Whether or not SV is fit for uh, micro microservices. Uh, there were surprisingly some calls made by uh, some statements made within the organization that micro for microservices you can't really use SV, but that's actually not true. Um, there were some tool ownership decisions. Uh, who, who should be owning the tool? Should it be given to the developers to use by themselves or should there be a centralized team who is already aware of all the functionalities of such a tool? Um, those were some of the challenging uh, discussions. And then on the technical side, dealing with asynchronous services, any stateful services and persistent services uh, that store data into databases. So we had some challenges in uh, working on such virtualized services. Um, then if we were to learn any traffic in a lower environment that was broken or did not have the right endpoints, how do you sniff out any traffic? So basically then we had to rely on reverse engineering. We, based on the design documents, we would think, oh, maybe this is how it responds. And it was through trial and error mechanism that we uh, created uh, such uh, uh, virtual services. And creating our, our own patches um, using Visual Studio, uh, Yakub, who is on the call, helped us create our own patches for the service virtualization tool, something uniquely that our customer was doing uh, that is probably not done at any of the other customers. So we had to create our own patches and that's possible using this tool. Um, doing the ROI calculations, it's uh, there is no fundamental formula for this, although we have very complicated sheets to create, uh, to calculate the ROI, but uh, those were some of the challenges if we were asked at point blank, hey, how much dollars did you save on this project? And we wouldn't really have the na an answer for that. Um, any integration defects, like I mentioned, blame SV first because that environment was connected to service virtualization, but we overcame those challenges by having a proactive mechanism and having some data even before somebody would blame us. And the very last thing, um, this is one of the aha moments. Um, so all the leaders that owned us um, at this customer team got promoted. So this is something to, as a, as a key takeaway, if you are looking to, um, uh, run this SV concept through your leadership, I would uh, keep that particular point in mind. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email it to me. My information is uh, displayed on the screen. Uh, so is my phone number. Uh, you can scan that YouTube video that you saw or you can scan this QR code. And if you like what you see, 
uh, you, you, or what you heard today, uh, feel free to engage us, uh, Patson USA, for any service virtualization needs that you may have at your site. Um, I would like to pass this uh, to Paul now, who would uh, be talking through the next two or three slides. Paul, it's up to you. Uh, thank you, Meet. Wow, that was great. Very interesting. Uh, a lot of great information there. Um, so uh, the questions will be answered offline and, and included with the slides and recording. Everyone will get a notification uh, when, when they're available. Um, the ITEM Summit, uh, join Vivit at the ITEM Summit to learn how to use hybrid IT as a competitive advantage through lessons from customers, partners, and MicroFocus's own internal experience, uh, February 5th to the 7th in Phoenix. Register today at the link shown on the slide. And we have some other uh, upcoming Vivid events that we're very excited about. Please uh, be sure to register. Uh, let your colleagues and customers know as well. Uh, these are also available on the Vivid calendar. We, ha we hope you can join us. And if you know, want to say thank you, uh, when this session ends, there will be a survey available to you. Please fill out the short survey, it's very short, and it really helps us bring you the content that's relative to you and meet your needs. So we, we appreciate your attendance and me, appreciate your time, and uh, thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.